Um, so let's have the first 25 minutes of our talk be uh, just questions that you all have for um, people who've read or performed tonight. And then after that, we'll open it up to all kinds of discussion more informally with each other. Cool. I bet someone has a question. There's, yeah, that person. <laughs> okay, um, for Johan, but you know, for anybody also, uh, an interesting comparison I realized between you. Uh, a term you used and a term that both people, Angela Davis uses a lot in her writings and her, her speeches, which is intersectional. And I would love to hear you expound a little more about that. She, she considers that to be a great failing of political movements and countercultures, that they, they fail to be intersectional, that is very important, that causes them to go wrong. Okay, so in case for any of you who didn't hear that, it was a question to expand on intersectional. And you referenced Angela Davis, yeah? Yeah, she yeah. uses that and it talks about yeah. that a lot. Um, intersectionality in terms of its, its history being attached to feminism, and somebody can probably help with this answer, um, was a, the term was first coined by Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, and someone who I've, I've recently started to read a lot of is Sylvia Winter, who kind of has a similar uh, process right now of trying to kind of grapple with intersectionality. Inter, just the word inter, means between or across. It's not within, which is this idea of inclusivity, right? Is that you already have to be part of the thing to be inclusive or something. Intersectionality is much more about cutting across the, the many different kinds of places or identities or territories or political, um, uh, I would say maybe the political isms that we're all fighting against. So for me, the thing about intersectionality is just a way of, of not just like keeping difference, but like honoring it and respecting it. Um, does somebody else want to talk about Crenshaw specifically? Maybe more. She's she's a, a scholar who coined the term in I want to say the late babies. Yeah. I mean I mean I only have like a, a little bit. I I saw Kimberly Crenshaw speak um, a couple of years ago. And specifically, um, she was trying to talk about, um, in, a, in a legal sense, in a social legal sense, the intersections between um, blackness and womanhood, um, and the fact that um, legal um, oppression and um, things that would persecute uh, black people would persecute black women in a very specific way. Um, and that experiences that black women were having were specific to black women. Um, and so I think it's, it's really necessary to note that intersectionality was like specifically grounded in an understanding of womanism and um, specifically like black feminism, which I think gets lost a lot when people are talking about intersectional feminism in a kind of like buzzword kind of way, which is like all of the social factors and the internet and so like I think like I think like that's great like I love all the social factors and the internet but like also like I think it's like really important to say that like intersectionality was created and was made to speak about the intersection of, of being a woman of color um, and that it then necessarily applies to how we all hold intersections within our bodies and not just across communities but that like any of us cannot speak about ourselves in an isolated way, that we're not speaking about any of our identities in a vacuum. All of our identities inside of our own bodies inform the identity 
bodies that are inside of our own bodies, you know? Um, yeah, so that's, to me, that's what intersectionality is, is that the principle that, like, nothing is happening in isolation of itself, so. what is like my conception of power look like in terms of being when we're questioning the subject the universal position the kind of normative hierarchy of how power works um, I mean I guess I think just immediately about a recent uh, one of the many of her recent talks at the New School when Bell Hooks talks about in an oppressor society you only understand power to work one way which is having power over others right and there's an exploitation of others within a hierarchy also so I'm always like really like uncomfortable with terms like strength and power and stuff like that like I'm just sort of like well what do you mean um, and that's why I guess I'm having a hard time in when I'm reading these books on healing trauma and whatnot, and they're all like, a sense of self-mastery will return to you. And I'm just like, uh, what? Did I ever have that? Do I want it? Like, I'm just very uncomfortable with language that gets used in certain contexts and what the connotations historically have been to say self-control or mastery or ownership and that kind of stuff. So I guess if I could imagine a sort of power that's different than this normative one, it would be like more of an empowered thing of having like power within that's then kind of like laterally, horizontally distributed without a hierarchy, like where I don't need my power to be over any one or thing else, but... Um, so, I like how you pointed them out to me. Um, <laughs> so, I'm thinking, like, you, know, you just sort of, I'm understanding conceptually where you're going, but Practically. you kind of, like, yeah, or just some image or something. Like, right now is an example of how there's, like, a different kind of power happening, and, like, I, I was speaking yesterday at this fantastic community uh, space, uh, queer collective that's run by Liam Kelly and Dara Roberts are sitting right there, um, called Not A Fluff. It's on San Pablo Avenue, um, North Oakland. And we were talking about what, what to do practically, like what is it, how are we gonna do this, you know, together? We know we gotta do it together, but how? And the thing I was saying was like, you know, I always think that scale is the enemy in the sense of like capitalist ideology is always to scale up, accumulate value with this idea that it will just be limitless. There's nothing about scarcity that we have to worry about or blah, blah, blah. So something about like keeping scale in mind in terms of like you and I can have a conversation that shares resources, shares knowledge, shares stories, bears witness, leaves evidence. I'm using a lot of Mia Mingus terms. But like to me, that's an example of like making a different kind of power. And it happens not because we're talking theory, but because we're just talking and listening. Like that's something that the system, right, doesn't do. It's like listen to you. You know what I mean? Yeah. 
I don't know, that's just like when I think about it, when I'm in my chronically ill support groups or abuse survivor support groups or queer, you know, family, we are like listening to each other and sharing and sharing our resources sometimes financially or like, oh, have you eaten yet? Let me get you some food. And and I think that's why I, like Mia, Mingus gave me two texts that I could read for tonight and I picked the Crip Solidarity one because to me, that's an example of like a way to do it. It's like, hey, we're gonna do this together. Like, if you can't go in the cab, well, we'll do it together. I think it has to be small scale, every day. It's like a practice, you know. The doing that gets done. I'm okay. Anybody have any? Like, does anybody else want to answer this question? Maybe we'll move. Is, did that answer you? Yeah. Okay. You can talk after more if you want. Well, I was just, uh, uh, you know, I, I work at a, um, at a health center, and uh, I was looking at, and I was online reading this NPR thing the other day, and uh, it's this article about how, um, about how social security is the new welfare, Social Security Disability is the new welfare. And, uh, you know, when I hear, you know, when I hear everybody and I hear you talk, I, I'm just thinking, you know, how is, uh, you know, how is the idea, which is kind of right now just in, you know, you're just developing, how is the idea of, of um, the, the sick woman theory, how, I don't know, is there a way that it translates into, into movement? You know, because I mean, the 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 like the entitlements, you know, which I think are rights, but the entitlements that that we as people who are on SSDI, you know, who are on SDI, you know, who get like eight hundred dollars a month to live in shitty SRO, you know, are under attack. They're constantly under attack, but even more so now, you know. And I just. Yeah, I, just, I, I, I really worry about that, you know? Because I mean, a lot of us here, we're here because we have affinity networks, you know, where we can you know, hear about it, see on Facebook, and come in, and that's, that's so wonderful. You know, I'm glad I'm here. You know, but then there's so many of us, you know, so many of us out there who don't. So, I just want to kind of move forward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having some mm moments with that. Um, yeah, mostly because I just I just wrote actually a piece um, about uh, what happened with Big Frida. I don't know if folks have heard about that, which is that um, Big Frida was um, prosecuted with a felony for um, receiving Section 8 vouchers, supposedly when she wasn't entitled to them. Um, and so I I wrote a piece about about how like. A, she, she was entitled to the vouchers when she was getting them, and B, like, making it as, like, a black gender flex artist in the South is not a stable income. Like, okay, great, they love Bounce right now. Like, they love it because Miley Cyrus said it was cool. So, like, how no, like who knows how long they're going to love it? Like, who knows how long you're going to make thousands of dollars off of that and going to need, you know, housing for your, for your friends and family after that. So... I, I'm on SSI, I think about it a lot. I think a lot about how we are not ever taught how to be our own social workers, and yet that is what is expected of us. Disabled people, people of color, poor people, all of the above are expected to be like such intense, very like competent managers of our own lives. Um, whether or not we have chronic illnesses, whether or not we have mental differences, whether or not we have learning disabilities, et cetera, all of the things that are supposedly making it difficult for us to be managers of our lives. We're supposed to be like so on top of our shit. Um, enough to then like report change income, you know, and say like, hey, like people decided they liked bounce music, so now I'm doing okay, and I just want to let you know, government, that I'm doing, I'm doing good. So I don't need that. Thanks for the, thanks for the cutback just now. I don't need any more. I might need it later. You know what I mean? So um, on the like movement bit, I, I can't speak to Joanna's um, feelings about like sick, sick woman theory as a movement, but I just want to say that 
disability justice as a movement is like a, a going and mo moving movement that I feel like is very, very connected to sick woman theory and um, is absolutely about the intersections of race, class, gender, and disability, um, and sexuality um, in like really, 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 really important ways. Um, and knowledge sharing and resource sharing surrounding like oh, like, you don't know how to have a personal care attendant, like, let me talk to you about that. Like, it's this whole weird thing. Like, IHSS is gonna, like, come to your house and, like, make sure you're disabled enough to, like, get the shit, you know? Like, it's so weird. It's so, it's such a fucked system, you know? Um, and so it, it can be, I feel like it can be really hard at times to be both, um, both an anti-capitalist and, like, a disabled, person of color who is like I I am so poor and I need to fucking use this system because what the fuck else can I you know can I get resources from um so I I just like find it really necessary to be very like engaged in what is happening on a policy level in terms of resources and services for people um, as well as being able to find what are models that we can create with one another on a horizontal level that is not reliant on those systems um, and I, I mean, I, I do really see like physical manifestations of that. Like I know that what I'm saying sounds theoretical, but it feels very like. So we have a place it's called Four Magazine. Dub 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 dub. Yeah. Sorry. No, I love I love Four Magazine, and like I love Leroy Moore is one of my best friends. <laughs> um, yeah. So I mean, yeah. I feel I feel like it's. I would really, I would love to hear from other folks also about how, um, yeah, how it's like intersecting with movement building. Does anyone? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't, um, so I guess this just makes me think we have, we have various institutions to associate ourselves with, you know, and I think marriage doesn't do the job all that necessarily all that well for many of us even though you know people fight for that as a right because that does have certain legal protections but we we need better legal structures and what i keep seeing happening is like activists get together and they make a good thing and do some sort of collectivizing and have this sort of horizontal movement structure you're talking about but then you sort of figure out a funding source and become kind of more legit and you become an agency or a nonprofit, and people get some jobs and so that becomes like the avenue of survival but then you're just co-opted into the whole horrible system. I mean, not completely, hopefully, <laughs> but like that tends to sort of get people really co-opted. And I wish that there were more ways to cooperativize or collectivize and, or form associations were for our own mutual survival. And I don't know how to do that. Not a lawyer, but we could try. I'll say something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, can you hear me at all? Am I saying? We hear you loud and clear. Good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really have an, have an answer except to say that, you know, a lot of, that obvious, well, I mean, as what's already been said, that being disabled is, is, um, or chronic and or chronically ill is so, um, enmeshed with, with institutionalization and that a lot of us have really sort of like fraught, complicated relationships with that, that we are oftentimes extort, like in really radical ways, moving against institutions that we deeply need and rely upon to, to survive, to stay alive. Um, and I think there is something that's kind of unique about that. But I do also know a lot of people, including myself, who've created like extensive networks of care that are um, that sort of operate beyond the bounds of those institutions, and that oftentimes this kind of life is about tacking back and forth between you know, um, you know, dependency on institutions while also realizing that those institutions oftentimes are totally unreliable and fail like every step of the way. Like I can give an example of 
you know, I just, I just moved. I had a job with health insurance and now I'm on Medicaid, but within the period, you know, because of, you know, the total, um, I don't know, in inefficiencies of, you know, the bureaucracy of that whole of, of social services in this country, there was a period of time in which I was uninsured, which is really dangerous for me because I take, you know, medication that costs $10,000 a month and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm a liability and I'm fragile and all of these things. But what was really funny was that I have like, yeah, I have this Canaries, which I think Amy brought up, which is um, which is a support group, an art collective, but is also kind of a care collective. And I, I put out a call for medication that I could not get a script for that I needed. And like when I say I needed it, like not like, you know, like, oh, I kind of need this thing, but like needed it. Like if I don't get this one for a week, I'm going to be end up in the ICU. And um, what happened was um, on this listserv, like I asked for this drug and somebody was like, oh, I was taking that. I have a full bottle of it. I'll just overnight it to you. And like it was this amazing way in which like a fucking listserv of like 70 people was like way more useful of a resource than like me going to the social search, to the welfare office over and over again and saying to my caseworker, hey, like I'm gonna die if I don't get this drug. And so, I don't know, I just think that speaks to the kind of like resilient networks that we build like in and through and like alongside the institutions that we rely upon. We're all nodding. Yeah, everybody's yeah. nodding. Yeah. Can't see anything. <laughs> uh, this is something Kian and I were talking about um, earlier. Um, that I, I'm responding to um, the, the the word uh, resilience, and um, and this is a problem with um, disability activism for me. Um, I, I have. Uh, connected with disability activism very little uh, in my six years um, of debility uh, because I don't have the spoons and um, and I you know I literally some some days have to choose between uh, writing and uh, cooking uh, or you know taking a shower and um, you know stretching it, it, it's at that level um, and one of the things that um, people want from activism is um, resilience. They, they want to see um, you know, the fundamental uh, fire of the human spirit in it, and they want inspiration, they want um, uh, you know, fire. And, um, and one of the things about chronic illness is um, it is a reflection of a lack of resilience. And um, not just physically, but um, you know, systemically. And so um, one of the things that I would require from an activism would be partners who could do things for me that would enable me to become active. And um, I haven't found that yet. Um, and it's, and of, of course, it, it is really difficult for one disabled, chronically ill person to ask another disabled, chronically ill person to be your your legs, your arms, your your heart, your fire, what what have you, um, and then of course um, you know the obvious answer would be um, to partner and ally with able-bodied people, um, but there is such a gulf of understanding uh, between. Uh, the disabled and, and able-bodied people um, that my, my closest friends, uh, you know, it's we're six years in, I, I make a point of regularly discussing what's going on with me and what it, the impact it has on me on Facebook and, and in my blog. And, um, and every day I'm still getting messages saying, you know, I never got that before. It's six years in. I never understood that before. Thank you for writing that. Um, there's just this tremendous gulf of understanding and I had the same gulf. I mean, I've been six since I was a ch small child, um, but I didn't get disability either because um, because I wasn't debilitated by my, dis my disability uh, until the last six years. So um, there needs to be an understanding which seems to me nearly impossible, and then there needs to be uh, a tremendous sacrifice 
um, on the part of able-bodied people, and um, and a sacrifice in the face of a lack of resilience and a lack of inspiration, rather than um, a sacrifice made um, to the fire of inspiration and resilience. And um, what has happened to me a lot since I've become sick is that people have picked around my story, my account of myself, to try to find, a lot of you will find this familiar, to try to find the positive. And, and, and then will press me to say this is positive. Um, and, and one of the things I think Johanna said, um, it was a relief to get the, um, the diagnosis um, because it's, you know, it's an acknowledgement. Um, I felt absolutely no relief when I got the diagnosis because there is no treatment for CFS. There's no treatment protocol for CFS. And um, there's no guarantee that you'll get better and a lot of sufferers never do. And so it wasn't a relief because as long as I didn't have a diagnosis, I could hope that I would find a diagnosis that would <laughs> offer me a treatment protocol that could cure me or better my symptoms. Um, and, but I've, but everyone I've talked to about CFS wants me to say that it was a relief. They want to end the discussion on a high note. They want to be inspired. Um, and then everyone tells me how brave I am. And I'm like, I, you know, what have I done to indicate that I'm being brave to you? I just bitched at you for an hour about my, my awful symptoms. I'm not being brave. I'm, you know. Um, so everybody wants this inspiration that I simply don't have the spoons to give, and, and, and I'm also too cranky, and, and you know. Um, anyway, but anyway, so, so that, that, um, that is just problematizing activism, and, and I don't mean to just be negative, but. Uh. Sorry, I'm pretty brain foggy right now, but the last question was about like moving, like how to move things forward. Like, what do people need? What do people, what do people like, how, how to, to do it? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that, I think then I just, one thing, I don't know, that's coming up for me since we, like are really like this panel is very varied we probably have different like um experiences and ideologies and different things to um up here and stuff and like um for me i don't know there's 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 the individual like 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 many other oppressions that are systemic and interpersonal like there's there's our individual experiences and then there's there's the systemic that exists. And I think that like, you know, one thing that, um, especially if like, you know, um, we talked about disability justice and, um, you know, we come like our, the ex like race, class, gender, and other things will get politicized, but disability will not, um, you have to fight for it to become politicized um, and like proving that it's even a political experience is exhausting um, and I think that um, there's I do think that there's many ways in which people are creatively um, movement building um, especially multiply marginalized people in different um, organizations that are doing good work and we you know Sometimes, like when we have the chance to movement build together, we try to make it so that, for example, someone that's working on um, trans justice, where they're centering people who are multiply marginalized, don't leave you know disabled folks behind, or if or or within disability, like who are we leaving behind in when when we're organizing together around a um, like a focus of. Of, of, of oppression um, and and also that you know we all hold a a an array of like oppression and privileges and we come into these spaces and we're you know we're doing our best to like to liberate together in ways that are um, in ways in which like we're doing it accountably um, and we're doing it, you know, we're, we're not just doing it based on words, we're trying to put things into practice. And, and sometimes we do that by like creativity, um, you know, talking about how you got your medicine 
through a listserv, you know, and there's there's groups on Facebook, for example, where people also will do medicine sharing or like call outs for access support um, when institutions aren't present. Um, so I guess I just wanted to like just emphasize too that um, yeah, like to me, liberation is is anti-capitalist. It's centering, um, it's centering, um, you know, people who are multiply marginalized um, and, and I don't know, doing that work politically and when we can, and, and interpersonally in the ways that we can. Um, and yeah, like even just when we're in a room like this, like, it's great that we're all in this room and also like who's not present, who's mostly present. Um, how do we, you know, so yeah, anyways, I'm pretty like fogging out and feel rambly, but <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> How long do we go at this before we all fog out? <laughs> <laughs> Too late for me. Um, so, uh, yeah, we should probably try to wrap up in about 15 or 17 minutes, but I want to turn the conversation over to you and ask you uh, to talk about your feelings and thoughts now or maybe ask each other questions. Before I do that, um, don't lament too much that we have so little time to talk as a group. There are yellow sheets that have SickFest sign-up information at the top on the merch table in the zine room, and I would really love it if you want to continue this conversation in some way, if you put your information there. SickFest is organized by a really loose collective of a couple of sick and disabled people. I don't know if there's going to be another one, but we will at least email all of us because this feels really good, and I'd like to keep it going. Cool. Does anyone want to say something? Hi. Well, one of the things I was excited to get from this space was to see other people, um, partly because my experience is that accessing service providers, accessing resources, a lot of things are structured for, it seems to me, things are structured for people with a fixed disability, and so a lot of people, uh, service providers, uh, they'll say, I really feel for what you're going through. I wish that I knew how to help you, right? Because we change from day to day. Things are mutable. Things are So it's not a fixed disability where this form of access will help you to work or um, so that's it. that's like my second question, or what I'm what I'm struggling with is like lots of identity around work, and a lot of women that I talk to who would like to be engaged and participate. And I actually was wondering the, the, the question for Liz around like how the growth of technology is allowing for access, is allowing for um, I need work that is flexible, not on a time frame that I can do from home, right? There's a lot of people that I talk to who are like that. So I'm looking for resources for how to educate like vocational rehabilitation um, on how do you support someone whose symptoms change day to day? Um, and also how do I um, educate other uh, people with chronic illness as to like, if they wanna work, if they can do something, like what is it that they wanna do and how to get connected, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, I actually proposed to talk to talk about that very thing to the Abilities in Tech Summit, Ability in Tech Summit that's coming up in May, I think, in Oakland. Um, and I think actually answering that would take a while, but I have found it to work for me. I am really not sure when I'm, people ask me that very question, like a lot, that's why I proposed to talk. Like, how do you manage to work full time? How do they treat you? How do you make it work out? And I don't think I've actually hit a year without going on some medical leave <laughs> yet, um, ever. But, um, but, but I do manage to do it, and it is a pretty good industry. I found for um, flexible work hours and so on. 
um, but I think the, the problem is kind of getting into it. <laughs> But aside from the actual work part, I do find that there's a lot, um, like the times that I haven't been working, working, I'm usually doing something online. Like I helped code and pull mud, you know, like a multi-user game text adventure kind of thing. You know, I did stuff like that. And um, <laughs> did you just laugh about buds? No. No, no, I didn't. Oh. I, 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 I was choked. Briefly. Sorry. <laughs> Took by the lights. So I guess engaging online and being able to talk to other people has been really great for me. Just personally, I spend a lot of time stuck in bed um, with my ankles up and stuff like that. Very bored. So I'm glad I can connect with other people in general online. Um, else? Oh, sorry. I just, well, I unfortunately don't have like resource advice in the same way but want to just like complicate the idea of a fixed disability so like I am congenitally disabled as in I was like born with arthrogryposis and so like what I was told about my disability is that it it was non-progressive or like non-degenerative like these are, this is the language that's used um, and what I learned is that there's all these things that like they don't talk about about how your body responds to various conditions that you're forced to put it in. So it's like, if I can't walk over a certain period of time, as in it's not sustainable for me to walk, so I start to use a wheelchair, then there's all these physical complications that grow out of being a chronic wheelchair user. Um, and there's all these complications that I have started to experience around chronic fatigue, around chronic pain, all these things that I did not think were associated with arthrogryposis. And if you look up like, you know, the symptoms of arthrogryposis. So I just think that like, there's a lot of opportunity for like, cross conversation between people who are congenitally disabled, between people who are chronically ill, between people who experience disability later in life to people who are born with disabilities because there is a lot of ideas that there is somehow like privileges among like, oh, you're privileged because I can't see your disability or you're privileged because people can see your disability. And I just think all of that is like really bullshit and really like something that was like in the question that was brought up earlier about like what people need and how the idea of like the new welfare is like social services for people with disabilities. I really think that like what that is, is the reality that like disability is starting to be visibilized at this moment. And so like, I just think that um, visibilizing disability on a level that is not just like visible and having like cross conversations that are very similar and shared between people who experience chronic illness and people who experience congenital disability and people who experience disability based on injury and like all these different things is like so, so, so important because we find ways to stratify each other and we find ways to separate ourselves and say, these services are made for these people and not for me. And in reality, like I'm asked to prove my disability every five years. Yeah. Everyone, I'm, I'm in a wheelchair right now, you guys. Like. It just doesn't change, you know? I have a friend who's a double amputee who is asked to prove that her legs haven't grown back, you know what I mean? So it's just say, like, the, the system that works against disability works against all people with all disabilities. So I just wanted to, to say that, not like as a, like a call out about the commentary, but just as a complication, so. Anyone else want to say anything? Someone? Yeah. Um, I kind of have a question. At first, I thought it was mainly for people with invisible disabilities and chronic illnesses, but it's kind of for anyone. Um, just about what your story was or thoughts were about claiming the word disability and disables in the first place. Like, as someone with a chronic illness, it's been a huge, huge life changer for me to be able to put aside like being able to claim that word has helped me put aside a lot of the shame and sense of personal failure that I had being chronically ill and it's able it's allowed me to accept my limitations and not even see them as limitations sometimes and a lot of that has to do with finding disabled community in my life and also just with all this reading and stuff where I'm able to put aside, like I said, some of that shame and then I go back home and I interact with friends and family, mostly family at home who are also very chronically ill who just keep 
throwing it right back at me and myself, all the shame, all the guilt, and if I mention the word disability, it's like this huge backlash. And I was wondering if anybody else has like a, a story for, I don't know, like how, like thoughts on on claiming the word and how to kind of deal with then the backlash that sometimes follows. I just have one quick comment. Yeah. Like that back at you. Um, just a quick comment to reflect that back at you. Yes, um, I used to be, uh, I, I didn't consider myself disabled with all of my illnesses previous to chronic fatigue because um, I was so incredibly energetic and I could do essentially whatever I wanted to do with the, 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 um, within human limitations. And, um, and I did. I, I was crazy. I did so much shit. I just did so much stuff. I still can't understand how I did. Um, and when I became sick, even after I got my diagnosis, which took two years, I still, every time I had a little bit of energy, would go full throttle out into the world, expecting to be able to do all of these things. And um, I was very embarrassed to use the word disability um, when it when it first you know, came upon me, but um, once I started using it, you know, and it started flowing, it actually caused me to behave more like a sick person um, and, and has actually enabled me to come to grips with my illness because I never wanted to behave. Um, my experience with um, the illnesses I had before was don't behave like a sick person, just, you know, do what you want to do, live your life. And I can't do that anymore. I had to readjust my attitude. So that's that's all I have to say on that topic. I just, I guess I would just, oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I just, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the computer wasn't turned, so I couldn't see the first person who spoke, but I just wanted to totally reiterate the same thing, which is that coming to define myself as being disabled was probably one of the most liberating things. I mean, I think I think I've more or less been disabled for the past six years and have only come to identify as being disabled for the past two. Um, but it, yeah, it essentially freaked me from like the need for any kind of normative identification and yeah, so much guilt. Like when you're in a body that's being read as as being able-bodied and you you are enabled to perform in that way, there's a lot of like shame and guilt that comes with that. And what disability allows for is a kind of acceptance of your body as as it is and that it and defines it not as a as a lack um and so i think defining i person i mean i i can't tell other people to define the way they you know people define however they want but when I, when i talk to a lot of other chronically ill people like i really tend to like forefront um you know disability justice and disability studies as like a really critical tool in like living as a chronically ill person. And I think actually that it's ableism that makes chronically ill people not want to define as, as being disabled. And that being able-bodied is, is, is aspirational, um, not for me, but you know, and so because of that, 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 um, that like, because it's aspirational, people don't want to identify as it. And, yeah, I just, I think it's it's a really important tool for chronically ill people, or else like we're just going to spend the rest of our lives like wishing we weren't what we are. I, w I wanna echo that and um, affirm that and also <laughs> say that um, I think, <laughs> I feel like a broken record a little bit, but um, I just want to say that, um, a li and I also kind of wish Mia was here because um, something that Mia Mingus has talked about um, is about the difference between being descriptively disabled and politically disabled. Um, and that is actually something that it takes a really long time, a lot of times for 
congenitally, orthopedically, neuromuscularly, physically disabled people who are very apparently or visibly disabled as well to come to, you know, because there are still so many people in your life being like, you're not disabled, you can do that thing, like, because disabled means you're fucked up and you've given up. Like, that's that's the definition in a dominant society of able-bodied supremacy is that disability, the definition of disability is that you've fucking given up. You know, and so to identify as disabled from an empowered point or as like a chosen identity is wild to people, you know, like and and it's wild even to people who experience disability because there's still this huge line between experiencing disability and being disabled because being disabled as an identity point is not encouraged. It's not a place of pride. Um, I actually, I don't know if it's the same Tali that Liz is talking about, but I also have a Tali um, who gave, gave me the, they told me, you have a people. Um, and it was, it was like one of the best moments of my life. Um, and it was at the Allied Media Conference. And I was like a cross punk who had been like hitchhiking across the country with a bunch of able-bodied people. And they were all like getting drunk. I, we were all getting drunk all the time and like passing out on the side of the road and being like, I'm so cool. And I go to parties and it's like so amazing. And I'm like, what the parties up two flights of stairs? Like, I don't even care. Just scary me. It's so crazy. Like, I'm going to puke everywhere. I love it. Um, and so so, and so I was like, I'm going to prove that I'm like the punkest motherfucker ever by doing all the shit that all these other people do, which I did, and I did one better because I got face tattoos. But the thing is, is that, the thing is like, and I am, I am the punkest motherfucker here. Always, always I am. Um, but, but I do want to say that like one of the most important things that was given to me during that period of time was this person, Tali, saying to me, you're not like all of them. Like you're actually not all of, like all of them, and actually there are people that are like you. Like you have a people, and you have a people who have been persecuted, and who have been killed, and who have been incarcerated, and who have been isolated for you know, like all of these really really important things that we talk about on so many levels in terms of race and gender and sexuality and all these things. But disabled people are a people. Okay, and so like that that is an incredible point of identity and connection and community. And I think like not to just say like, yeah, you know what, like I fuck you. I'm not going to try to be able bodied anymore. The fact that that is something that is so empowering and important for chronically ill people. It is also like so empowering and important for people who were born with the physical and very obvious maybe disabilities that they have is that like we've still been told like whatever is happening to you is happening in isolation to you. And that is not true. That is not true. Everyone, so many of the fucking people in this room are having that experience right now in very different ways. And like, those, those are your people. So just put that on them. <laughs> Can I just add on to something? Um, another thing is, is that like, yes, and I, I love, Thank you, thank you for everything you said. Um, and there is, I mean, I also just want to point out, just like there's variances amongst other, um, it, it, it gets irritating to, again, trying to prove to people that like disability is a political identity. There's a culture, there's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a culture and a people and a history, right? Um, and also there's, um, without going into the intricacies of it now, but like contextually too, like we, like as disabled, as disabled people, we can hold privilege like in relation to one another in complicated ways. Just like you can say there's POC, but then there's, there's, there's black and brown folk and folks of different colors and shades and, and experiences, and some of us are settlers. Some some folks are indigenous. Like we, like even when we have these political identities around like disability or POC, like we hold different relationships of power to those identities. And similarly, like with disability, like we can be a community that share. Like just like a POC community can share an identity and like in relation to white supremacy, but also like that doesn't mean that like non-black POC can't be anti-black or like it doesn't mean that like so like you can't be disabled and be sanist or you can't be disabled and like 
you know, I don't know, like not have issues cross disability with one another because we're working on ourselves. We're working on our <laughs> internalized shit and like there's a range of stuff and like so I, 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 I feel like there shouldn't be there shouldn't be a leveling out. Like we should, and we should hold our complexities and our and and the different relationships we have in power, and and, and acknowledge those things instead of try to like erase them, while also again holding the holding these words as 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 political identities, as cultural and political identities. So I just wanted to acknowledge that too. In addition to yes, yes, yeah. work. <laughs> I think this shouldn't be over yet, but it is. Um, hey, Catherine, do you have people to thank who I'm going to forget? I'm going to thank some people. What about this little scones? Okay. Let me, well, speaking of scones, those scones were donated by Arizmendi, which is great. Um, Acme also donated a lot of bread. Take a baguette on your way out. I'm not kidding. Please take a baguette. Um, thank you so much, everyone, to coming, um, for coming. Um, thank you to all the volunteers in general, the people who donated body work and energy healing. Um, oh, Jenny Williams. Is Jenny here? Because this was... <laughs> She was the one who brought Johanna into our lives, into my life. Yeah. Um, and M.G. Sparrow, who is one of the co-organizers who's hiding kind of late. Um, Catherine, who's hiding in the dark, another co-organizer. Um, and I think that's, oh, and oh my god, and the people at Chapter 510 who are letting us use this space for free. got a grant today that's a huge deal for them and it is well deserved. Um, and so thank you Tavia and Janet here and Justin Carter who helped us find this place. I think that's it. Let's go socialize very briefly. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>